What's going on everybody, LK here, and today this is an introduction, a character overview for the characters in Persona 4 Arena Ultimax 2.0. So I'll be going over what type of character each character is, a couple of pros and cons for each, and then at the end, since 2.0 they change shadows, I'll again quickly describe the shadow characters and the advantages and disadvantages to playing them. That's a choice that you'll have to make whether or not you want to play a shadow version of the character or not. So first we have Narukami. So he is your jack of all trades, your Ryu type. As the anime protagonist of this game, he does need to be an all rounder. He's pretty easy to play. He excels both at long range and close range. He's able to control space well with moves like his 5B, standing B, crouching B, 2B, jump 2B, and projectiles in 236C or quarter circle forward C. Now, while he's still a good character, he is uh, toned down from the previous version, 1.1, in a couple of ways. For example, uh, he can no longer combo off his throw without using some sort of resource. Previously, he used to have a command grab, so he has this as his normal command grab, but this move used to be a command grab, and now it's not. This is core circle forward A, B, or A plus B, so this is two, three, six, A, B, or A plus B. Now, this used to be a command grab also, but now they changed it into a move that is special cancelable. Also, many of his moves are not jump cancelable on block, so his 2B is not, his 5B is not, his 5C is not. Even the second hit of his auto combo is not. The main one is just 5A. So you'll have to rely on his range in order to play your offense game. Then next is Yosuke. So if you like those fast characters like Bang and Blaze Blue or Chip in Guilty Gear, this is basically the character for you. Some people considered him to be tied for the best character or the best character in the previous version. They've toned him down a little bit since then. He's super, super fast, can inflict poison with his throw, has a good parry for his B plus D, the Dragon Punch reversal that everyone has called Furious Action. Can consistently end combos into knockdown into more pressure. And Awakening, Sukakaja is a super strong move that makes him really fast and changes his auto combo. Now he's gotten a few nerfs too, but the big one for people would definitely be how he can't use his old gliding technique, which used to have him fly from the air to the ground really quickly and follow up with an attack. So this hurts his mix up game a little bit, but he's still a really solid, very fast character. So next we have Chia. So Chia is a rush down type. She's really excels when she's close to you. So while the previous two characters were somewhat all around types, even Yosuke, who's like technically a fast type character is basically good at everything. She is especially good when she's close, and she benefits a lot from one of the changes they added to a lot of characters' moves, but I'm going to mostly be mentioning it when it really impacts the character's game, is the fact that her persona moves that she uses in neutral, so her standing C, crouching C, and jump C, are now invincible until the first active frame. She's also quite a fast character, and she's very hard to anti her because this move is also not considered a jump in, which means characters can't use anti airs to anti air the move. They have to find another way to hit that move. So, for example, here, the 2B from Everybody, also known as Crouching B, is an anti air. So, this beats head attacks, but if you use this against her jump C, you will never, ever, ever win unless you somehow hit Chia first. So, the other thing to note about Chia's playstyle is power charge. So, this move quite literally powers her up. It makes her deal more damage. So for a simple damage comparison, that did 2091. If I do a power charge, it is 2473. So you can imagine how much actual optimal combos will be affected by you using this. It's actually one of the main reasons you'd want to consider choosing Shadow Chia instead of Normal Chia. Now, main downsides of playing her, she doesn't have a lot of personal cards. It doesn't matter too much though, considering she's mostly rushing you down with her normals. And her range is not good, so you do have to navigate characters who either have bigger normals than you, or use a lot of persona attacks to get close and run your game plan. 
So then we have Yukiko. So she's one of the zoners in this game. So she's actually traditionally been a low tier in this game, but they gave her a few things to really help her out in this version. The main one that you'll see a lot is that she can throw way more fans than before because she recovers faster. This might give you some Smash Bros. melee double laser type energy. She's very reliant on her persona and she has more persona cards than other characters. And a lot of her game plan revolves around using the C and D buttons to control space. A lot of her persona attacks, like all of her C moves, all versions of Agi and Muragi and Flame Dance, they all have this persona invincibility up until the first active frame to really, really help out how she controls space. This character is a little bit tricky to play though, because since she's really reliant on her persona, You'll have to understand a system that the game doesn't really explain to you, but I will make a video on a little bit later called the Persona Displacement System. So a basic idea is that you can send your persona somewhere and then other persona moves will appear there instead of where Yukiko is. So a good example would be this is Yukiko's 5C, the standing C. It'll be up to you to experiment with these moves to come up with structures of your own to use against your opponent. Now, her main downside is that she doesn't have a normal anti-air. So her anti-air instead is with these fans. So while they control a lot of space, unlike other characters, anti-airs where they're air unblockable, Yukiko's is not. So once you play against an opponent who's good at fighting against this and understands that Yukiko has problems dealing people from the air, some characters will give you a lot of problems on the approach. That being said though, she is good at controlling space and she has a lot of unique things with her persona that she can use to control space. So you can run your offense from both point blank and from full screen ranges. And finally, another thing to note for Yukiko is her defense is pretty bad. Her A moves are slow and her DP is this pillar, which while you can heal with it, characters can deal with this really easily. So keep in mind that if you have to block with Yukiko, it's going to be a tough time. So Kanji is a grappler, one of the main grapplers of this game. So your goal is to get next to them and mix up strikes or grabs to open up your opponent. He has a bunch of special things he can use in his offense to make it really scary for their opponent. So one is that his EX command grab actually applies paralysis to the opponent, which means they can't move. Once you grab them, they can only do system level movement like roll or short hop. Two, the game system itself helps him. So one, for starters, in this game, you actually can't do a wake up back step. So when you knock them down, unlike other games, you won't have to think about back step as an option. The only character that can do it is Aegis and only in Orgy mode. Two, if you notice, I'm jumping and blocking, but Teddy's already in the air. So in this game, after you jump, so there's four frames where you're jumping, but the character doesn't look like they're jumping. But then for an additional five frames, you can't block, which really helps with how you can do pressure. Then on top of that, his DP is really hard to safe jump. So essentially you can't do it. And people will need another way to cover this option compared to other DPs in the game. The way some spots of his strike throw mix up game is set up is also very fast and hard for the opponent to react to. Really standout normals would be this, which is his 5B, standing B, and also the second hit of his auto combo. He also has a move that vacuums, so it pulls you in closer, the Persona to C to help reestablish the strike throw game. However, he has a few problems as well. So one, unlike other characters who can just run, he has a little extra startup on his run. He's not fast in particular, and that little startup on his dash does matter. Two, his forward air dash is also quite slow and he doesn't travel very far. They do compensate with this by using air turn so that he can move a little bit faster because his air back dash is pretty fast, but his normal air dash is quite slow. It doesn't go that far. So like most grapplers, you'll have to deal with zoning and screen control. The good news is, as I mentioned with Yukiko, she doesn't have like a good anti-air. She just has something to control the space. 
So he can fight zoners pretty well. He has more problems against characters who control their mid range better than characters that actually run away. Now, on the other hand, we have Teddy. So Teddy was one of the best characters in the previous version of the game. He's an item throw character. And in my opinion, he's the reason why they try to keep item throw characters down because he used to be really, really strong. So his main mechanic is going to be around the D button where his persona, Kintoki Doji, will throw an item. One thing that makes it hard for the opponent to play against him is that he has two sets of item orders, one with his 5D and the other with 2D. So the Teddy player should always know what item is coming next because they aren't random, but the opponent generally will not know and have, will have to react to the items as they come out. You can also throw items from the air as well. So if a character can't get up here very easily, then he's able to throw out items somewhat safely. Like Kanji, his DP causes a status effect, but instead of paralysis, it's rage. The main downside to him is that the nerfs they gave him, the two biggest ones both involve the items. So there are items now that you can interact with, and I'll show you what I mean in a second. And you could hit his persona while he's throwing items, where before you really couldn't. So for example, here's the Mystery Food X, and I can hit it at him. So there are a bunch of items you can hit towards him. And then this, the legendary bite key. So when he gets it, it's still the same. It goes back and forth. But when the opponent gets it, now they just get a little meter and the bike doesn't come out anymore. In the previous version, the bike would come out anyway. It would just come out one time. So now here I have him throwing the item and having Kanji use his Thunderbolt, his 5D, to hit the persona. In the previous version, when Teddy throws his item, you probably would not hit it. This was because previously the persona was projectile invincible. So most of the things that people would be able to use to hit from a long range, the persona would just be invincible and you can't do anything. And then the item that you can't interact with would just do its thing and Teddy would get that screen control. So that being said though, you can still use the items to control a lot of screen space and make up mix ups on the fly and pin your opponent down to get your offense going. So next we have Naoto, she's a hybrid character. She both is good at runaway, but with traps. And also she has a special win condition that other characters don't have. So at a baseline, you're going to be using traps to control space. These traps are invisible until you get close. A particular note, these traps, the 214D or core circle back D traps, you can't like use jump ins to clear them out. You have to use a ground attack to clear them out. So when these are on the screen, it's implied that her anti-air is better because it's much easier to tell when an opponent is gonna try to go above you when you have this to protect the space in front of you. Use these traps in combination with her gunshots to control space. In addition, she does have another win condition. So certain moves reduce the fate counter, which is that skull underneath Mitsuru's persona cards. So once this reaches zero, you'll be able to use Mudon and Hamaon to insta kill them. So normally this will do no damage. But in the case that the fate counter is at zero, you will get an insta kill. Naoto also has a lot of ways to inflict status effects that just put the opponent in really bad situations. The main one would be with this, the EX shotgun which puts silence and fear on the opponent. So not only will they not be able to burst, nor will they be able to use uh, persona moves for a little bit, but then also they can't tech throws and the next hit will be a guaranteed fatal counter, which has a little bit more hit stun than a normal hit. So on Fatal, that jump A and jump C will connect and you'll be able to get a combo. Now, her main downsides is that she's really reliant on her persona moves and her DP is also persona DP. So if she ever gets persona broken, she's in a really bad spot and her own moves don't have that much range. So she's really reliant on her persona over everything else in order to create this game plan. So next up is Mitsuru. So Mitsuru is a pretty standard character. She really excels at mid range where her sword, her 5A, is just really, really, really huge. You will be mostly using your sword to fight, but also she is good at fighting out of range as well, using her persona to strike people who are hanging too high in the air with 
2D or people who are zoning too much with 5D. In this version, they gave her a couple of extra changes like her charge 2B launching so that she can get more opportunities at reward than normal. Now, while her mid range is really strong, her main issue is that her pressure has a lot of gaps. It's both a strength and a weakness. She uses this to create opportunities for her to get hits, but also it creates a lot of space for the opponent to guess their way out. So if you're not comfortable with the opponent being able to take a lot of opportunities against your pressure, then you might not like playing her. So right now I have the CPU set to guard first only, to just to show like how many gaps there are under pressure. So anytime the CPU gets hit, it means there was a gap. That being said though, she has a lot of ways to feint to keep herself safe between her 5A into backdash cancel, sweep feints, and taking advantage of her B button to create space to make it seem like there was a place the opponent could do something. So next up is Akihiko. So Akihiko first has the least amount of Persona cards in the game. It's two, but he doesn't use them very much. This is your boxer character. So he's a rushdown character that plays really well at close range. Uniquely too, his jump is pretty low. So it's hard for people to see his jump ins. Plus it's Persona 4 Ultimax. So anti-airs are weaker than the original version of the game. So the big thing for him is that he has unique mechanics that are related to boxing. So he has both a weave and a duck that he can use in com combination with different special moves to create really unique pressure. The more he cancels these moves into each other, once he goes into weave, duck, kill rush, or a couple of other moves, the higher his cyclone level goes up and the properties of his moves will change depending on what level he's at. If you're willing to use resources as well, he even has tricky mix-ups he could do where either he can peel off with the EX weave or go through the opponent with EX duck. So while he struggles at range, he does have uh, 5D to pull people in. But generally, in my experience in the game, this doesn't help out too much because it's behind a persona move, so it's pretty easy to snipe. His main issue is definitely going to be on the approach. So while they gave him things to help deal with certain zoning moves, as this is invincible to some moves, he's not very fast and his jump is pretty low, so it's easy for people to control space and keep him off. But once he's in, he's in. So then we have Aegis. So this is a character I don't recommend for beginners. It's not super easy to execute with her and you have to manage an additional resource to Orgia meter. So unlike uh, Arena 1, she does get to use the resource a lot more. And when you're in this mode, you get access to instant overheads using the Orgia dash. Her damage output also is quite high in Orgia mode. Problems with her, so she is like Yukiko where her 2B, crouching B anti-air, is more of a screen control type anti-air. So people will be able to try to jump at you a little bit more aggressively. Also her range is not very good either. So you're going to be relying a lot on her jump C and Orgia mode in order to approach the opponent. So then we have Labrys. So Labrys is a momentum type character. She has this axe gauge above her meter, which goes up as it, it changes colors, but it goes up as you rush down more. And when you're in red, you get access to not only different move properties, but also your super will do a ton of damage. So she did like 3.7k off her auto combo. So again, if you have actual combos with her, it will do a ton of damage. That axe is also not for show. It does control a lot of space. Her jump B is a very strong jump in that's hard for people to deal with. And this move, while slow, does control a lot of range. Now, she has two major issues though. So one is that she's a momentum based character. So she rewards you for winning, but it's hard to keep that momentum and the gauge will go down as you are not attacking. And then the other thing is her defense is not good. So her buttons that she matches with, her A buttons are not fast, and her DP is a guard point. So characters can get away from this if they structure their pressure well and use like jump cancels or something to get away from it. And then we have Shadow Labrys. So as a side note, it's not Shadow Labrys, it's Labrys. Shadow regular Labrys, Shadow Labrys. Anyway, it's not Shadow regular Labrys, it's Shadow Labrys. The same character as Persona 4 Arena 1. 
she has her persona out at all time, this bull, and she can work in tandem with it to create unique pressure, neutral, and knockdown setups. Really, really tricky ones. Besides the bull, her neutral game is similar to normal Labyrinth, where she still has the big control with her jab and jumping B, but her knockdown game is significantly better. Of note two is her Awakening Super to Tanomachia, which lets you control the persona a little bit and have a full screen hitbox. It's really hard for people to deal with. Now, the biggest issues you'll run into playing Shadow Labyrinth, one, she's not for beginners. So if you're a new player, she's going to be pretty tricky. Don't let this discourage you if you like this character, but just keep that in mind. It's not going to all click right away. Two, she's very persona reliant. A lot of her offense, combos, and mix up all rely on her using her persona. So if someone breaks your persona, you're in serious trouble. She doesn't have a lot of life, so she dies quickly. So you have to be careful on defense. So next we have Elizabeth. Elizabeth is what I would call like a one shot character or one chance character. So her main goal is going to be trying to put the opponent in really bad situations using her persona. Now, unlike other characters, she has the ability to put herself into Awakening immediately using Mind Charge. And many of her attacks get powered up when she's in Awakening. For example, this is what her lasers look like normally. So here's the A laser, the B laser, and the EX version. Now, if I use Mind Charge to power up, here's the A version, much faster. Here's the B version, slower, but there you go. And then here's the EX version, which fires two very quickly and applies paralysis. She has a lot of moves that apply status effects to the opponent. Where her 2C applies fear, the EX laser applies paralysis. Now, a couple of issues for her. So one, she has the worst type of DP you could have in this game. Don't let people tell you this is fine, by the way, because when I was playing another character who has the same type of DP, a grab DP, people were telling me it was okay and the defense was good. Her defense is not good. The big issue being your opponent can tech your DP. <laughs> so your DP is not guaranteed. And because it's a grab, it loses to things that would beat grab. She's not very good at mashing out on offense either. She very much relies on her persona. So while she is very good at taking advantage of this buff to persona moves, if you break her persona, she is in real trouble. And also she's just not very fast. So while I said Kanji was not fast, his issue, he has that start up on his run. She just straight up cannot move. And to top that all off, she has low HP as well. However, if you want to look at a really unique way to play this game using a lot of Persona cards and exploding with momentum, I would definitely recommend Elizabeth. So next we have Yukari. So she's a zoner. She uses her bow. She's quite fast and you'll be using her arrows in combination with her Persona moves in order to control space. So in particular, if you fire arrows through certain moves, the arrows will track to where the opponent is. She also has a pretty decent setup game because her combos end with her feather flip, which either ends in a silence status effect or a charm status effect. So you can either take away meter from characters or lock them out of their persona. Her comeback potential is also good, seeing how her awakening super is this giant tornado that gives you opportunity for mix-ups. So the main thing about her, her defense is not very good, so... Her DP is not super great. It does look interesting, but it's really easy for characters to deal with. Similar to other zoners, her anti-air is blockable in the air. So you're going to be relying on controlling space and it, it might be hard for you to hit people who are trying to force their way in with jumping. Her combos can be quite difficult for newcomers. So not only the timings for things, but also their screen position dependent. So next we have Junbei. Uh, he is the baseball character. So... <laughs> Frankly, he's a pretty standard character who who has a unique mechanic in that he needs to try to score runs. And if he gets 10 runs, he'll level up. He'll use Victory Cry. So that sound is the clean hit sound. So I did a very basic, very, very basic example. But once you get powered up in Victory Cry, you will be able to use clean hits to really extend your combos, do a lot of damage, take them to the corner, etc. He also is has pretty good opportunities with mix-up using this, his jump D, when you can set it up properly. Now, the biggest thing that's going to be stopping you from playing this character is learning the clean hit combos. So, these the clean hit requires a specific timing. In fighting games, we call these just frames. In a certain window, 
you need to press the button so that you get the effect that you want. To my knowledge, they made it slightly easier in this version. So you need to really be proficient with your combos to make sure that you can get the most out of this mode. Because outside of that, he's just a normal all around type of character. So then we have a Dachi. So he is, in my opinion, like a comeback style of character. So he's a pretty standard character before Awakening. And he has stuff that shows off important things in Ultimax overall. So for example, him having this massive JC in a game where they weaken anti-ears. So in Awakening, he used this move, Mandala, Bagatsu Mandala, to power up his persona. Once you get this power up, his various persona moves all inflict different status effects. The main one being that they took away Rage so that he used to have unblockable setups. So for example, this is Standing D, 5D, which inflicts Shock. Or his 5C, Standing C, which inflicts Poison and Fear. Generally, his main issue is that if people are good at dealing with this move, then it is hard for him to play neutral. And he's not really like a super standout character outside of Awakening. So while you're able to set up all these situations with various status effects after you hit them with the Awakening super, before that, you don't really get to do that. So a lot of his strongest things are locked behind Awakening. So then we have Sho and Minazuki. And Minazuki is the one with the persona. That's the easy way to remember it. So Sho has no persona and thus no persona cards. And he has, instead of having an attack here on his standing D, 5D, he has this dodge, which you can follow up with an attack of your own. So Sho is very mix-up heavy. He has a lot of feints and teleports that he could do to like switch sides. He's kind of like the tricky rushdown type. And the main things for these stepping moves, the 2, 3, 6, C, and D, and EX, is that the EX ones can go through the corner, both the ground ones and the air ones, and they recover really, really fast. You can create some tricky mix-ups with these. But the one that you will see way more than show will be Minazuki. So they share a lot of the same normals. His sword normals, both of them, are very large. They're generally two attacks, as my dude is a dual-wheeling, edgy anime boy. And his persona is very good at controlling space. So not only does he have the benefit of these good normals, but he could use the persona moves to either control space or crush zoning. Then unlike Sho, he also has command grabs, but he needs his persona to be available to do so. He's a really solid all around type with no real flaws besides he's just not good at mashing out. Even though he has a normal DP, his A buttons are slow. So next we have Ken and Koromaru. I jokingly in the previous version just called him Koromaru because the dog is going to be putting in all the work. Ken doesn't use his persona very much. Instead, your C and D buttons will be usually for moves of Koromaru. So this character is basically a puppet character. But the thing that makes him stand out is your puppet never uses resources. That bar is actually an HP bar. So I can just press this forever and ever and ever. You can just hit him and his HP will go down. But Ken has ways of healing most of your special moves. He can create situations where he can high-low you. Now, the main thing is, if you ever kill Koromaru, well, he, he will come back eventually, by the way. But he comes back very, very, very slowly. And Ken is missing two buttons without Koromaru. And Koromaru is what you use to really put together your offense. So then we have Risa. She is sort of a hybrid neutral rushdown type character. Uh, she is another character that benefits a lot from the weakness of anti-air in this game if her jump B. And once she's in, she has a lot of ways she can set up pressure, especially if you hit them already, by setting these notes, which she can pop with a microphone to add frame advantage to her following pressure. On top of that, she has a special status effect called Scan. So once it's on, it'll change the property of some of her moves so that it will track to where the opponent is. So for example, if I did like this, this is her 236C, her circle forward C or EX, which goes really far. If I do it in the air, it kind of just moves normally, right? But if I have the scan applied first, it will track to where opponent is, and it doesn't matter how far the opponent is, it will just go over there. So you can say she has a two-step neutral, where if you get the scan, then her neutral is gonna be way stronger because everything tracks, so you get to just run it. So that would be her major downside though. So she's a little bit reliant on her persona because you do use this to control space and set up your neutral. But if you don't have your persona, then you can't do these things. And because of how strong the status effect is, 
it could be a little bit predictable. Like the opponent will know eventually that, hey, Risa is going to try to use moves like her 5D, standing D, to try to st set up the scan. So I need to play a little bit more aggressively and stop her from setting up in the first place. Once she gets going though, she has really, really strong. Once she gets going though, she has a really, really strong way of getting in. Good pressure and good mix up. So next we have the fan fiction character, Marie. So she has good normals for both playing screen control and approaching. And she has items she could summon to help her control space and see where the opponent's gonna go and try to counter. She also has a special mechanic that is really reminiscent of Persona 4 where there's going to be weather on the screen when she's in play. And depending on the weather, different things will happen. When it's cloudy, she can use her core circle back to a four and she'll get two clouds instead of one and her throw and DP will both inflict paralysis. So when it's raining, she'll have a passive buff where she'll slowly regen her HP. And it'll make this awakening super fire more shots. And it'll make her awakening super fire more beams. When it's snowing, her, her meter will passively go up. Now, her main downside is that like a lot of her stuff takes time to set up. Like She can't just do it, she needs space to do it. She does have good screen control for deep persona moves, but they're not fast. Also, she's way scarier with meter. So when she doesn't have meter, she kind of struggles. And then last but not least, Margaret. Margaret is a pretty tricky character to play as well. She has the most Persona cards out of any character, and she excels in both neutral and mix-ups. But not only is she a lot faster than Elizabeth, her normals are all very strong and either travel a good distance or they have something like they're disjointed so you could use them in unique ways. She takes advantage of the Invincible Persona buff as well. And in order to be effective with her, you need to understand the Persona displacement system that I mentioned before. which sends the persona in different spots on the screen depending on what you did before. Her damage output is also very high if you get counter hits. Or with her awakening super, Hasotobi, where the damage will greatly increase if the combo counter is at a multiple of eight. For example, let's say you do this type of combo. So as you see, it did not add a lot of damage, but if you do this instead and end the combo on hit 24, you see the super will do much more damage. Now, her main weakness is similar to her sister, Elizabeth. She does not have good defense. She's a tall character, which is not a good thing in this game. Uh, her DP is also a grab, which means it not only can be teched, but it'll also lose the things that beats grabs. And her buttons are not good for mashing. Like she gets good return if she counter hits you with her fastest button, crouching B, 2B but it's not a fast button. So when you do it, you do have to take a pretty big risk. That being said, when she has resources, her defense is a little bit better, but they cost resources. And then like many other Persona characters, she's very Persona reliant. They gave her a ton of Persona cards. She has eight. So it's very unlikely someone will break her Persona, but in the case that they do, you're in a really bad spot because she uses them for everything. Offense, combos, mix-ups, everything. So last, a quick look at shadow characters versus normal characters. So in the previous version, shadow characters did not do too much. They were mostly irrelevant besides Shadow Narukami, Shadow Yosuke, Shadow Naoto, Shadow Mitsuru. So outside of Shadow Naoto, Shadow Narukami, Shadow Yosuke were good just on the basis that they were the two best characters in the game, but Shadows and Shadow Mitsuru had really good high damage combos in Shadow. Now, the main thing that's different in this game is that 
they have a burst to activate Shadow Frenzy instead of needing 100 meter, which means you could do it much more often. So even at 20 meter, I could just activate it. I don't need 100 meter to activate it. This gives you more opportunities to use Shadow Burst as a cash out. They have more total HP because they don't get the awakening bonus that normal characters don't. And they do slightly more damage compared to the normal version of a character. And most importantly, in Shadow Frenzy, when you hit somebody, even with normals, they can't burst. And then finally, they have access to Awakening Supers no matter what. So I can do Mahabufudine here, but this version of Mitsudu cannot because she's not an Awakening. This makes it so that their ability to spend meter to do damage it can be, depending on your character and how they go into these combos, very, very, very good. And very, very flexible, which can lead into wild momentum swings depending on what happened. And even if you're down a little bit, you can still be in the game. So whether or not you want to use the shadow mode is up to you. They are a little bit more combo intensive because you're going to need to know how to spend your resource in order to make the most out of the character. An example one of Shadow Mitsuru. So you will have to learn these combos to make the most of this version of the character, but some characters get a lot from them. So the main ones that people would know from this version would be Shadow Mitsuru, Shadow Chie, and Shadow Ken. But there are other Shadow characters that have unique game plans because of the Shadow Fury mechanic. But that's it. This one was a long one. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments in the comment section below. I tried to keep it really simple just for the sake of time because I could actually talk about these characters in way more depth than I did in the video, but we have to go through all the characters. So hopefully these gave you a quick glance at what each character did and whether or not you want to try them. Like and subscribe if you guys feel like it and I'll see you next time. Peace out.